Satan will use all your emotions so he can be victorious. His name is the deceiver. The pastors don't think these things are going on in their congregation. I believe that the devil does exist. Be a disciple and make a disciple. If you don't do that by being a pastor, spectator. Confronting the Devil with the Overwhelming, Almighty, Omnipotent Power of the Lord Jesus Christ. His power is absolute. He cannot be stopped. Welcome to Confronting the Devil, Fearless Dialogue. Here's your host, Kevin Collier. Welcome to the program. Today's guest, Josh Pack of the Skywatch TV program, Into the Multiverse, and the return of evangelist Robert Noddy, founder of Searchlight Ministries of Australia. But before we begin, my wife Kristen offers this prayer. My dear Lord Jesus Christ, no one took your life from you. You laid it down of yourself. You had power to lay it down and power to take it again. This command you received from your father, John 10:18. You are coming soon to destroy the lawless one with the mere breath of your mouth, 2 Thessalonians 2:8, and to judge the living and the dead, 2 Timothy 3:1. Out of your mouth comes a sharp sword with which you will strike down the nations, because you yourself tread the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Revelation 19.15 Please fill us with your power. 2 Timothy 1.7 Help us to be strong in you and in the power of your might. Ephesians 6.10 In your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen. Thank you, Kristen. I see you have something else you want to read here. No reading from Martin Luther today, but these are the words of Johannes Eckhart, a German theologian born in 1260 who had a profound impact on Martin Luther, from Treasury of Daily Prayer by Concordia Publishing House, pages 465 and 66. I am sure as I live that nothing is so near to me as God. God is nearer to me than I am to myself. My existence depends on the nearness and presence of God. He is also near things of wood and stone, but they know it not. If a piece of wood became as aware of the nearness of God as an archangel is, the piece of wood be as happy as an archangel. For this reason, man is happier than the inanimate wood, because he knows and understands how God is near him. His happiness increases and diminishes in proportion to the increase and diminution in his knowledge of this. His happiness does not arise from this that God is near him and in him, and that he possesses God, but from this, that he knows the nearness of God and loves him and is aware that the kingdom of God is near. So when I think on God's kingdom, I am compelled to be silent because of its immensity, because God's kingdom is none other than God himself with all his riches. Thank you, Kristen. Josh Peck is an author and the host of the Skywatch TV program Into the Multiverse, a weekly program explaining quantum physics, among other dimensional topics I do not understand, with his equally intelligent wife, Christina. He's also the founder and active writer for The Sharpening Point Online. Josh, welcome to the program. Hey, Kevin. Before we step into another dimension, Josh, I just want to mention that my wife and I are big fans of Into the Multiverse, and we love the show. Oh, great. Thank you so much. That really means a lot to me. Josh, what would you say to those who think the devil is a thing of fiction, folklore, and legend? Most of the people who would say that probably don't have a religious background or spiritual belief. So, of course, it's easy to say something is myth if you haven't actually seen it. But, you know, of course, we see evil in the world every day, all the garbage that's going on in the Middle East and the extreme persecution of Christians. So we know at least evil exists, and even most atheists will admit that. The idea of it being a uh, physical embodiment of evil that we would call the devil or Satan or Lucifer, every religion or belief system has some form of that character. Now, me being a Bible-believing Christian, I believe that the devil does exist and that he is extremely malevolent. But to those who want to believe that he's myth, they might find some comfort in that, but the harsh reality is it's just not true. Josh, you often write about exposing the works of the enemy. Can you dive into that for our listeners? Sure. A lot of times, one of the most frequent types of requests or questions that I get for my show are from people who have had one-on-one experience with some type of demonic manifestation in physical ways. For me, it started with sleep paralysis when I was a kid and on into my adult years. I had really bad sleep paralysis, but I would get physically attacked by what I am assuming are demons. 
So since coming forward with that part of my testimony, I've received a lot of people who have had similar experiences and wanted to know how to stop it. Of course, the simple answer is you stop it in the name of Jesus. If you're a saved, born-again Christian, you have access to the authority of Christ to be able to stop these things. If you're not a Christian and trying to mess around with this stuff, it might not end so well. I like to bring guests on my own show who have had similar experiences or at least know about it, and we don't talk about that in every show, but it does come up quite often. That's one avenue of how we expose the works of the enemy, but also things that go on behind the scenes, either geopolitical things or stuff in science or any avenue where we feel the enemy is trying to deceive people, we try to expose that the best we can. Can you explain extra-dimensional warfare? Sure. Basically, the cut-and-dry version is the term extra-dimensional and the term spiritual are actually synonymous. They mean the same thing. Usually, scientists or physicists, they'll use the term extra-dimensional, and they come from a point of view that is absent of God. But we Christians, we come from a view that where God is everything. So for us, we use the word spiritual, but when physicists and scientists talk about extra dimensions, they are actually talking about the spiritual world. They'll never admit to that, most of them. There are a couple that will, but uh, most of them won't ever admit to that. But when they talk about extra dimensions, that's essentially what they're talking about. It's the unseen reality that exists all around us at all times. Well, that's the spirit world. That's the heavens or, you know, whatever we want to call them. So extra-dimensional warfare really is the same thing as spiritual warfare. It's all Ephesians 6 stuff. It just goes back to using the name of Jesus and walking in truth every day to have authority over these things. Josh, in your book, Quantum Creation, it addresses the theory that the supernatural exists in the fourth dimension. That includes evil. Yes. I believe that, at least with the fourth spatial dimension, it's kind of a mixed bag. And I theorize in the book, and, and you know, this is just speculation, I don't know this for sure, but I theorize that when Satan and the angels fell, that they may have actually fallen to the fourth spatial dimension. Now, that's not the same as time. Time's a temporal dimension. That is the fourth dimension if you're putting dimensions of space and time together. But if we're just talking about dimensions of space, yes, I do believe that there are evil entities that exist in the fourth spatial dimension, but I believe that there are some good ones, too, if they're passing through or if if God has something for them to do. But yes, I do believe that evil does lurk there. Here's a hypothetical question, but I have to ask. Where do you think the devil lives? What's his address? Mm, That is a good question. The Bible tells us that he's the prince of the power of the air, but whether that means an actual physical location or if it's more just the title he's given, we're not sure. Like I said uh, in the previous question, I do speculate that possibly in the fourth dimension, but there are times that we see throughout the Bible that he manifests in our dimension as well. He possessed Judas for example. So there are times that he exists right here with us, and we might not even know it. We're, we're also told that he can appear as an angel of light. So there might be people who are thinking they're seeing the good angels, uh, but in reality they might be seeing Satan himself or some other type of fallen angels. So I would say probably the fourth spatial dimension, sometimes here on this earth. That'd probably be my best guess, but again, it's speculation. Concerning your book, Disclosure, how has the enemy convinced the Church that warfare in the spiritual realm does not exist? Oh, yeah, yeah, and we see it all over. I've been to churches that just don't deal in spiritual warfare. With most churches, if you go in and you say that you've had an encounter with aliens or something, or or a UFO, or if you've been attacked by a demon, chances are they're going to send you to a psychiatrist before they're going to get you some some actual help, something that can actually help you. I think that's one of the enemy's biggest deceptions, is that spiritual warfare isn't important, prophecy isn't important, but it's in those things that we have authority over the enemy. That's why they don't want us to know about it. And when I say the enemy and they, I'm throwing everything fallen, everything rebellious against God into that category, so that'd be Satan, fallen angels, demons, all that stuff. If we're ignorant of the fact that we can actually stop these things, well, first, that these things exist, and not only that, but we can stop them, we have authority over them through Jesus Christ. If they can keep us ignorant of that, that lets them do more that they want to do, you know, wreak havoc and cause all these problems for everybody. Uh, I think that's the main reason why they want to obfuscate that from the Church. Josh, I have to admit, I watch TV programs like Ancient Aliens and Ghost Adventures, but I understand this really is about demonic forces. I find it curious that if it's E.T., it draws an audience, but if it's biblical supernatural, nobody tunes in. 
Yeah, it absolutely is. A lot of times they like to take the ETH, which is the extraterrestrial hypothesis. That's among UFO researchers and people that believe in that sort of thing, the mainstream accepted view. It basically means UFOs and their pilots are from another planet, similar to ours. A lot of times it'll even go further than that to say that they are the ones that created us. Now, of course, they never ask the question, well, who created them? They assume that it's some type of evolution, which there's even less evidence of evolution in an alien than there is even here on Earth. But what's starting to become a little more generally accepted is the EDH, or extra-dimensional hypothesis. And that's the idea that these things, at least some of them, come from a higher dimension instead of another planet. And and the evidence that is put forth for that is because sometimes these UFOs that are spotted, they look completely solid, but they can change shape and form, and they can zap in and out of existence, which should be physically impossible. But if you add an extra dimension, those types of things are perfectly possible. But the main important thing is the vast majority of them are not looking at this from a Christian or a biblical perspective. Even most of the people in the EDH, I happen to subscribe to the EDH, I believe that they're extra-dimensional, but again, extra-dimensional and spiritual are synonymous. Interestingly enough, too, even the non-religious ones, the non-spiritual UFO researchers that subscribe to the extra-dimensional hypothesis, most of them will say, yeah, they're malevolent. They don't really know how to frame it or how to think of them or how to define them, but most of them will admit that they are here for their own evil purposes, they're not here for our own good, and they do nothing but deceive people. So I think that's pretty interesting that even somebody who is isn't coming at this from a spiritual worldview or a supernatural worldview even, they can see how these things are evil. Yeah, I absolutely agree. The whole ancient aliens deal and all these shows that really promulgate this stuff, all it is, it's pushing an anti-God agenda. Josh, what does your book, Spiritual Warfare Against the Satanic Government, address? That one's mostly about Ephesians 6 and how it answers this question of how we as believers, how do we have authority over the enemy and how can we exercise that authority, whether we're being attacked or a friend being attacked, or even if there's a lot of different forms of attack, you know, demonic attack. It doesn't always have to be a type of physical manifestation. Sometimes what some people might call just really bad luck, a lot of times can be due to that. So it's all about how to recognize you know, what something is, and a lot of that is just by asking God, but also how to gain authority over the enemy by using the name of Jesus and exercising the authority that he granted us from his work on the cross. Where does the Bible and physics meet? It not only meets, but it marries, right? Uh, Yeah, that that was what inspired my book, Quantum Creation, because I had that question, too, because it would seem, especially in our modern age, that science and religion don't have anything to do with each other. But actually, science and the Bible really go hand in hand. The problem is, usually what we look at as a disconnect between the Bible and science is really a disconnect in the interpretation of the Bible and the interpretation of science. Like, for example, I heard one physicist who's who's absolutely brilliant, I like his work a lot, but I heard him say that quantum field theory disproves that there's an afterlife because there's no quantum field to take the information of consciousness anywhere. That's an interpretation of a science. Now, quantum field theory is a science, and I believe it's a legitimate science, but that's his interpretation of it. You know, there's nothing intrinsically in the science of quantum physics, really in any science, where you could prove that there's no afterlife. It's an interpretation. And if we're being honest as Christians, we do that too. You can take five Christians and give one Bible verse and get five different interpretations of the same Bible verse. So there is a core truth somewhere, you know, because God created everything. We know God is truth. God can't lie. He won't lie. So there is a core truth somewhere. But due to our limited perception, because we're human, we're flawed, we're subject to entropy and all these things, we don't always get a full grasp of what that truth is. The stuff that we can be sure about is the stuff that God told us directly, that Jesus told us directly. The gospel, how to have eternal life, accepting Jesus into your heart, how he had to die on the cross for our sins so we wouldn't have to die eternally in hell. Those are things that we can we can hold on to is solid biblical truths. Now, when we start getting into things like timing of the rapture, or when scientists get into things like how many dimensions there are, you know, whatever, it's all based on interpretation. So a lot of times these differences are really just a difference of opinion or interpretation instead of there being a difference in the Bible and in science as a whole. I look at science as just the study of God's creation in different forms and different ways. Uh, If the Bible's true, and if there is a God that's fully truthful, 
then the study of him should be true, too. So I believe that there is a core truth in science, just unfortunately in our modern age, most of the people in charge of how science is dealt with are coming at it from an atheistic or anti-God point of view. Josh, I have one more question, then I'll release you from this dimension. How has your study of the multiverse impacted your faith? For me, looking at the Bible with that in mind has really helped put a lot of things in perspective, especially when it comes to extra dimensions, because that's basically what the whole Bible is about. My very good friend, L.A. Marzulli, he likes to refer to the Bible as the guidebook to the supernatural, and I love that, because it's absolutely what it is. So when I look at it, I can see it, in a sense, as something that can help me get a grasp on different things in quantum physics, and it does. The whole first chapter of Ezekiel, that is all quantum physics and extra dimensions. I mean, even to the part of explaining how those, why those angels seem to be melded together into one weird kind of construct that physicists today called extra-dimensional unfolding. It's basically if you have something from a higher dimension that unfolds into our dimension after you do it enough times, eventually some of those parts are going to take up the same space. Uh, in my book, Cherubim Chariots, I go into great detail to explain that. But the more that I look into quantum physics, which is basically just the building blocks of reality, like it's the materials that God uses to create everything, and it all goes back to his voice, the ultimate material, the ultimate thing that blew my mind. It's an obvious statement to say that we're created by the voice of God, but with an understanding that quantum physics brings to the table with that perspective added into that, it's not just that we were at one time a long time ago created by the voice of God and now we're just here dealing with the ramifications. We're actively still being created by the literal voice of God because God's outside of time. He's in time too. He's also in time because he dwells in our spirits with us. But he's also outside of time. When he first created time, there was no time because he hadn't created it yet. So when he first spoke that word of existence, that's still what we are. It's string theory. Every particle is made from a string, or if people prefer quantum field theory, every particle arises out of a quantum field. It's the same ramification. The idea is somewhere there is energy coming from that is creating these particles. This don't know where it's coming from. All they can say is it's got to be something extra dimensional. But for me, that's the voice of God. That's where that energy is coming from actively all the time. It's amazing. If you look at our hands right now and know that right now in this very moment, your hand is a literal product of the active voice of God right now, not something just from thousands of years ago, that too, but also right now. So I can really see how God's used that to uh, help me understand a lot of biblical concepts, and I just love it. Scripture says that it's the glory of kings to search out a matter or the, the, the honor of king. Basically, it's, it's the whole deal where it's good for God to conceal things for those who want to know them to go out and look for them, and that's an honor for us. That's a pet paraphrase, but <laughs> that's, uh, that's basically what that verse is saying. So I absolutely love it, and it's fascinating. Thank you so much, Josh. Keep up the great work and Godspeed. Oh, thank you so much. It was an honor for me, so I appreciate the invite. Thanks again, Josh. Watch him and his wife on Into the Multiverse on Skywatch TV. And Skywatch TV is on Roku in the religion category. So add that channel today. My next guest returns to the podcast. Evangelist Robert Dottie, who lives in Australia, is the founder of Searchlight Ministries. Robert, welcome back to Confronting the Devil. Robert, last time we talked a lot about the deceptions of the devil and how he operates. Isn't one of the lies the devil likes to play on Christians is to make us think God has abandoned us? The devil is a master. Let me give you an example. I had this friend of mine who was just saved, and he came to me and said, Look, I keep hearing the devil telling me that I'm not saved. And I said, Well, that's terrific. He said, Well, what do you mean? He says, Well, Think about it. If the devil tells you that you're not safe, that you're not saved, you can pretty much be assured that you are, because if you weren't, why would he tell you? <laughs> he would just let you happily go on thinking that you're saved, and then he would take you to hell, right? And say, yeah, I never thought of it that way. And then there's another friend that just started speaking in tongues, and the devil was telling him, those tongues are for me. You're speaking the wrong tongues. That's just gibberish. They are satanic tongues. Well, again, the same rule applies if there were satanic tongues. Why would he tell you? If he's telling you, it means that it's a lie because he's a liar and the father of all lies. But he's very good at making you feel like an orphan. He's, particularly if you're sick, he'll say to you, let me ask you a question. Can God not heal that disease? Yes, he can. Well, has he healed it? No, he hasn't. Well, then why is 
He doesn't want to heal it. And it makes you angry towards God. He's constantly trying to blame everything on God. His strategy has never changed. It's always the same. He still uses the same strategy that he used with Adam and Eve. And that is, did God really heal you? Did God really save you? Did God really baptize you with the Holy Spirit? It's the same garbage. But once, once you realize that it's the same thing, then you recognize him very quickly and just dismiss him quickly. And again, when he comes, don't fight him. Just turn over and say, Father, I thank you for I know I'm saved because the blood of Jesus saves. And, and you start worshiping God. And as you've submitted yourself to God, you've resisted that thing. And that thing has to go. And it will go because the word of God says it will. Robert, let's address atheists who are not supposed to believe in God. It seems the majority of them are God-haters or target Christian symbols, which reveals they do recognize God. The devil has talked them into hating God, right? Yeah, that's exactly what he's done. Look, I've had a lot of conversations with atheists, and to me, I keep telling them all the same thing. Do what a lot of people do. If you truly want to know if God is real or not, then do what a friend of mine did. He just looked up, he was an atheist, and he said, God, I do not believe you exist. And as a matter of fact, I think that if you do exist, you're doing everything wrong. But you know what? In the absolute possibility, unlikely event that you do exist, then reveal yourself to me. And if you do, I'll believe. And you find that if they genuinely do that, if they genuinely want to know, and I would encourage them to do it because one or two things will happen. Either they will be proven right that there is no God, but I can guarantee you God will always show up because he loves them that much. He loves the Satanist. He loves the, the atheist. He loves the witch. He loves the warlock. He loves homosexuals. He just hates homosexuality. He just hates Satanism. He, right. he just hates the sin. Right? So mm -hmm. if, if you truly, if someone is an atheist, and I would encourage anyone that is, just do yourself a favor and find out for sure and prove me right or prove me wrong. Look up and say, if you exist, God, show yourself to me. And he always has. He's never let me down yet. Robert, don't you think it's about time the churches started preaching about the reality of the devil? It's as if the devil has paralyzed some churches. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with you 100%. The devil has neutralized them. How can we possibly fight an enemy that we know nothing of, we know nothing about? The average Christian out there, if you ask him, can you tell me something about the devil? Oh, we don't have to worry about the devil. We have the victory in Christ. Yes, I agree, but do you know how he operates? No, nah, we don't have to worry about that. They've been convinced that they don't have to know anything about him because Christ has the victory. And yet Jesus says, pray incessantly. Always guard yourself. He's always warning us against the devil and the evil one and the things that he can do. He's telling us to watch out for the devil goes about like a roaring lion to see whom he may devour. Christ is saying, watch against this thing because this thing can kill you and send you to hell. And yet the church at large just ignores it and that is a serious mistake. It's something that the devil relies on and it's something that the devil will continuously keep working on in keeping the church busy and doing all sorts of other things other than focusing on him. He just likes to be in the shadows. He likes to be in the background. He's a coward. You see, he's one of the biggest cowards in the universe. He's a copycat. He's a loser. He's all of that. Once you've walked with Christ for a while, you get to see his absolute supremacy. And I'm talking about Christ's supremacy here to the extent where you no longer fear the devil, to the point where you really have respect only for the ability that he has. Because he had no authority. Christ has stripped him of that. But he has a lot of ability, and he can only defeat you if you listen to him. This is why the battle is in people's minds. If you start listening to what this thing is telling you, the minute you acknowledge it, the minute you agree with him, you have given him what I call the spiritual legal rights to absolutely start creating problems for you. This is why you must always, like Paul says in Ephesians 6, just put on the armor of God. In other words, if I can put that in succinctly, that is, just keep your eyes on Christ. Just keep your eyes on Christ. If Christ didn't say that, don't say it. If he didn't do that, don't do it. Do what Christ did and you will never go wrong because he came to earth to be an example to us on how to defeat the enemy. And he defeated him brilliantly. We give the devil his power. He never crashes a party. We let him in. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> I'm going to use that, Kevin. If you 
<laughs> but it's true, folks allow him in, and then they complain that he's there. Yeah, exactly. Just keep your eyes on Christ. Just know who you are in him. We have absolute victory. This is the great news, Kevin. The devil is powerful only because we make him powerful. Christ has taken all authority from him. He stripped him of all the authority. I remember the Holy Spirit said to me once, Son, you have the power of the Most High God inside of you through the indwelling of me, the Holy Spirit in you, the full authority in Christ to use that authority and to use that power, and yet you tremble and we are sick and you're afraid of the devil. When you grow up in Christ and when you know who you are in Christ, when you get that relationship and you walk with him, you get to see the supremacy of Christ and you get to see just how powerless the devil really is and that the only reason why he can be powerful is by deceit. That's it. Nothing else. Continuing on the topic of allowing the devil into your life, one thing is sin. If you're an active practicing sinner, it's a devil magnet. The devil is a where there is sin. So if there is sin in your life, you need to deal with that because if you don't deal with it, you are giving the enemy space and it'll come the time when that sin, as in James, it will bring about death and that's when the enemy can come in and really clean up. And history is witness to how many huge ministries have been destroyed over the years because the enemy doesn't do it all at once. He he starts like a sailing boat, you know, he sends you at one degree of course, and then by the time you've done, you know, a hundred nautical miles, you are so far out that it's just almost impossible to recover. Yeah, those little moves add up to a great distance. It's crazy, I tell you. And, and a lot of times, the Lord has allowed that to happen just so that he could show me. I can tell you my walk with him has been amazing because he's literally made me experience everything so that I can talk about it. One of the things I've learned is a lot of the preachers in churches today, they're making some fundamental mistakes. The first thing they are doing is that they've removed Christ as the center of everything in their church. Amen. They've made him a reference point rather than the central point, which is extremely dangerous. The churches today are not talking about the devil because they're more interested in numbers than they are about building a flock that are powerful and can make a difference for Christ. And by doing so, they've been totally neutralized. That's caving in on numbers. That equates to money. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know if you've had the opportunity of looking at the two parties that the Holy Spirit made me do on tithing. I don't know how wrong that particular doctrine is right now. It's just so rampant around the world. It's just crazy. But the Lord is so good. He keeps calling him. He's not come to judge the world. He's come to say the judgment will come later. So for as long as we are alive and we can breathe, we can repent. And this is what I would urge to all of these preachers that are on the wrong track with money. Just stop it. Just stop it. It's not worth it. You'll be regretting it later. Well, our time is brief, but I appreciate you on the podcast, Robert. Can you close our program with a prayer? Father, I just thank you today for giving me the ability, Lord, to be the vessel that you could speak through, that you, Lord, have a message to say to some people out there that are going to listen to this podcast, that they will understand just how powerful they are in Christ, that they will start seeking you out, Lord, and getting to understand their authority in Christ. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you will touch every one of their hearts and that many will change and we'll get on a course where they will have absolute victory over the devil in everything they do. Because Jesus is Lord, period. And the devil will always bow his knee in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much, Robert. God bless you and your ministry. Thank you. Okay, God bless. And to our listeners, you can expect Robert to return to the program very soon. And now, my lovely wife, Kristen... Can you close our program with a prayer? Lord Jesus, though ruthless Pontius Pilate declared your innocence before the crowds, you who knew no sin became sin for us. May the shame you bore for us on the cross give us the greatest honor, so that we might always see that only in suffering can we see who you truly are, our glorious King and Savior. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Thank you, Kristen. Coming up next program, Dr. Roger Barrier of Preach It, Teach It. Here's a preview. 
most pastors are hurting about people in their congregation that have hurt them. That's far and away the biggest hurt. You know, if you get hurt, you get angry. <laughs> and so there's a lot of very angry pastors out there. Don't miss our next program, and that wraps up this one. Thank you for your prayers, and remember, do not let fear paralyze your faith. This has been Confronting the Devil with your host, Kevin Collier. Visit online at confrontingthedevil.blogspot.com. Thank you.